Good afternoon. I'm going to do a check. Um, can can everyone hear me on Teams? Yes. Hello. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for Grand Rounds today um, for the Cloud CME. The session number today is 201. It's 201. So you're going to text that and then you will automatically, your attendance is recorded and you'll be able to find the evaluation after Grand Rounds. Today, we have an excellent presentation from Dr. Antosh and Elise. So we're really excited about that. And um, we're going to let them introduce themselves since, since there's two speakers. We're just going to let them say a little about themselves and go from there. If you guys are having any trouble with cloud CME, just let me know. Email me or call me. If you're having trouble getting into the session, texting that out to cloud. But I have to say so far, we've been really lucky because I've had like just a handful of people that were having issues and we were able to resolve them right away. So that's a really good thing. OK, everyone, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to our speakers. My name is Elise Huntley. I am a certified child life specialist. Thank you. I've been here for about six years covering a variety of different outpatient areas, focusing on promoting positive coping, specifically or primarily in medical imaging and surgery, and then now the new SCC building and all of the outpatient clinics. And I'm Sean Antosh, if you don't know me yet. Uh, pediatric anesthesiologist here. I've been here almost eight years and I've worked closely with our child life colleagues to develop our sensory program in surgery, which we've now expanded throughout the organization. Um, so we're here today to talk to you about utilizing our adaptive sensory environments in all hospital settings, um, including outpatient. So. I'm going to do the objectives. Maybe. Um, so after today, we are hoping that you understand sensory processing dif differences good volume and, for you. Yep. and how it may uh, impact patient experience in the hospital setting. Uh, you'll learn about what we can offer here, both inpatient and outpatient, and then also how to create your, create your own adaptive sensory environments um, to facilitate positive coping for our patients. So before we started talking about what sensory processing differences are, what these environments are, we wanted to kind of take a step back and review what are those senses. So you have the very common external senses. Most people know that's your sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, kind of those big five that we commonly talk about. But we also wanted to call attention to those last three, those internal senses, vestibular, which is also movement, and that's your balance. That's the sensations you receive in your inner ear that tell you if you're standing upright and kind of send messages to your body to help you move smoothly. Your proprioceptive, which is your body position. So that's information about where your body position are, those sensations that come through your muscles and joints that kind of tell you how much force to use as you move through the through your environment. And then interoceptive, which is your internal organs. That's kind of that autopilot, that state of arousal where you recognize, oh, my stomach feels weird. I must need to eat or if I need to use the bathroom and things like that. So it's kind of those internal organs that are communicating with your body about what tasks need to be done. So what does sensory processing typically look like? You receive the information. It comes in. So maybe you hear a noise. Your ears pick up a sense. And then you organize. The brain tries to figure out what is that information? What do I do with that? Is that noise a coworker coming in the office or it is, a, is it a bear in the room next door? Kind of figuring out what that is and how do I respond? And then output. The brain sends instructions to your body for what you need to do. You've heard that noise. You're debating, is it a coworker or a bear? You realize it's more of a thud of a book versus a roar. And then you tell your body, okay, say hello to my coworker. It's a safe sensation. That sensory processing is a neurological procedure of organizing that information we take in from our bodies and the world around us and using it for our daily use. So as we grow and develop is how we determine what these stimuluses are, what can affect it, and how we perceive them. So if we take an image 
right here, we're using bottom up processing. We have no other contextual clues to say what this is. This could be a picture, this could be a letter, it could be a number. Now, if I give you context of an A and a C, our brains realize that this is a B, right? We put this into context. We're using our top down processing of information we've previously learned to say that is a B. Now, if I give you the same image and give you a 12 and a 14, suddenly it becomes 13, right? So we're taking everything we know about our world and determining what that is. So what happens when we can't process the senses as we um, develop? So this video is from the UK, uh, and I just want everyone to take a second to imagine you are this child walking to the mall for the first time. I'm autistic and I just get too much information. So when I walk through a mall, that's not my experience, right? I can process all the input. I'm not distracted by the people in the different stores. I want my pretzels from Auntie Anne's. I'm going that way. I'm not distracted by what's around me. I have something in mind. For our friends who can't process the senses accurately, they're struggling with it. They can't figure out which one is the best, which one is important, which one matters to me. How do I respond to all this input? That's their experience. And that's what we call sensory processing differences. And we chose the word differences today very intentionally. Because when we talk about SPD, that D could be a variety of things. It could be a disorder, a delay, difficulties, dysfunction, diversity. And we chose differences because it indicates that everybody processes their sensations in a unique way. It's also very broad because as we talk about these different things, we're not looking at just our friends with autism or a specific diagnosis. We're looking at everyone who's struggling to process their sensory input in some shape or way. The other important thing to talk about when you're talking about this is that it is neurological. This is not a problem with the parents letting the kids get away with stuff. This is not a behavioral issue. This is neurological. Their experience in the mall is different than my experience in the mall. And there's a couple different types of sensory processing differences that we want to real quickly just review. Sensory discrimination disorder is when the central nervous system can't process those sensations. So they can't use that information to function. Maybe the child has difficulty processing sensations of pain. Maybe they can't tell the difference between two different sounds. Or when they feel faint, they can't connect that it's because they're hungry and they just don't know why. The sensory-based motor disorder, which is kind of broken into postural challenges and dyspraxia, Postural challenges is that low muscle tone, poor, coordina poor coordination, hard to stabilize one's bodies, sometimes referred to as like the sensory slumper. So the kid who's laying down, covering their whole body on the floor to get all that input. And then dyspraxia, so the inability to organize the body to move. So information struggles to get from the brain to the body. A lot of times with that coordinated movement, like skipping and jumping is harder if you don't have that connection. And then sensory modulation disorder. I think this is the one people normally think of when you think of sensory processing differences. These are those patients with sensory over-responsivity. So they have a very low threshold for sensations. You give them a little bit and it overwhelms them. Sensory under-responsivity, 
very high threshold. They're looking for a lot of sensation, a tight hug, a lot of input. And then craving. Those are the ones who can't get enough stimuli. They just need more and more and more sensory input. So how common is sensory processing differences? Prevalent studies kind of range between five to 16 and a half percent. We've quoted a couple of different numbers here. As you can see, a large percentage of our patients with autism have sensory processing differences, about 40% of kids with ADHD. And children with higher childhood trauma scores, it's correlated with more difficulty with sensory processing. So when we're talking about this, it's not just the kids with autism, it's everyone. It's our patients who have trauma because of being chronic and long-term patients, trauma from whatever event has happened in their past, whether it's social or medical. And this is affecting a lot of our patients. 90% of children with tic, tic, tic disorders experience some form of sensory dysregulation. Patients with sensory processing differences are at a higher risk for restrictive eating because of that sensory. So they're seeing providers in GI and nutrition. Autism is correlated with a higher risk of refractive error and strabismus. So these patients with sensory processing differences, they need eye exams, follow-ups, and then a lot of, it's a lot correlated with seizures often. So these patients are also getting EEGs and being followed in neurology. So they're touching every area of the hospital and all of you will encounter them sometime. So for me, I like to do a visual representation of what this feels like and why um, these patients have certain coping mechanisms in place. So for a neurotypical patient, if we take a cup of water and we fill their glass, it fills it all the way to the brim, right? So we're taking the light in this room right now. It fills our brim exactly perfectly. Now, if we take a hypersensitive patient, their cup is much smaller than our cup. So we take the same amount of light, try to fill it up into their cup, it overflows, right? So there's too much light, it's overflowing their cup. If they're hyposensitive, their cup's much bigger than our cup. We fill up with the same amount of water, it's not all the way full. So that difference is what their coping mechanism is. That's where the stimming behaviors come from. They're trying to figure out what to do with the extra water or not enough water, because they want their cup perfect just like we want our cup. And the one thing that's important is, every sensation is different, right? So it could be that they're hypersensitive to sound, but hyposensitive to light. So it's all of those that we talked about earlier that we have to be cognizant of when we're working with these patients. So stimming, again, is that um, self uh, repetitive behavior or sounds. All Every one of us stims in a certain way. We probably just don't perceive it. It could be biting your nails, twirling your hair, fidgeting, pacing back and forth. We all do it. Um, and it's to simulate the senses or decrease sensory overload. Again, it's talking about our cup. Is it too full, not full enough? And what are we doing to compensate for that? It helps us reduce anxiety, calms ourselves. You can, they can use it to express frustration, um, especially if they're having trouble communicating. And one of the things that's important is once frustration happens and they're not able to communicate, um, the stimming behaviors may get worse. And it's a normal response. It's not something unless it's self-injurious or injurious to us, we should let them do their stimming behaviors. They are calming themselves in the best way they possibly can. So common examples, rocking, flapping of hands, bouncing, jumping, pacing, pulling of hair, um, rubbing the skin, repetitive blinking, staring at lights, sniffing at people or objects, rearranging objects. So again, things that we may not consider normal um, is something that they are able to use to cope for themselves. Uh, and I'm going to steal a, a least example from last week. A patient's stimming behavior was pulling strands of carpet. So Elise found a carpet square for the patient to pull the single strand of carpet out one by one, right? I mean, who in this room would probably do that? And Elise said it was much harder than it looked. So it's these things that we need to be cognizant of and know about our patients to be able to take the best care of them possible. They wanted to, we wanted to show you a little video kind of demonstrating the differences between those sensory seekers and sensory avoiders, because that's going to change the support you provide. That's going to change the environment. Kids can change between these two as well. So it's not always, like Sean mentioned, it's not always that they're seeking and they're avoiding. Sometimes one day they want all the input, sometimes the next day, just not in the mood too much. So as we talk about these, and kids aren't locked in to one or the other. I don't need no light to see you shine. It's your golden
So just kind of wanted to show you that for some of those patients, they love that. And you see the joy as the demonstrator moves into it and gets that input and then other people sometimes kind of avoiding. So what does this look like in the hospital setting? Okay. Do you want to just have a seat Hi, my name is Matt. This is what it's like to be me. Hospitals can make me nervous, but I'm glad that my mum is here to help me. Sometimes I get overloaded with information, but I still need good health care. So the next part of this is interactive. So we need everyone to take out their phone real quick. Let me find it. And you use this QR code and you know, it's just a one question survey. What makes a hospital setting hard or outpatient or just the medical setting that we are, we are in every day and these patients come into? And we'll give you about a minute to log some answers. So everyone's come up with some great answers. So I want you to think about it. If you walk through the front door, main entrance of our hospital, walk into our beautiful atrium, right? It's beautiful, but what is it? It's 100% overstimulating. On the right, you got your coffee cart. People buzz in there, machines go in. You have a huge dragon flyer with a lot of colors, a lot of things twirling, people walking in and out. And it's better since the ambulatory tower kind of moved. Uh, it's not as busy, but you have the cafeteria, so you have sounds, you have smells that are coming out of there. You have people talking really loudly. You're trying to get somewhere you don't know where you're going. You may have never been in the hospital before. So these are the things that we're able to process out. But for these kids, they're not able to process it as, process it as easy as we can. We'll get back. So what do we do? How do we support these patients? The first is assessment. Who is this child? What do they need? No two kids are the same. Every kid needs different support. Are they sensory seeking or sensory avoiding? I have one patient in particular who is very overwhelmed by sensory. So if she's stressed, you gotta take away that sensory input. She puts her headphones on, mom will cover her eyes, and that's how she calms. Another patient about the same age who's seeking. The only way we can get him through an eye exam is sitting on a vibrating seat cushion with a vibrating toy on his chest, holding a vibrating light spinner. And then he sits still, but that's the only way you can get him to sit still, right? So figuring out which kid is which, what do they need? And then in that assessment, we have coping plans. I'll go through a little more later, but basically it's an individualized care plan that tells you about your patient, it tells you who they are and what kind of support might be helpful. And then we have our environments. So our child life team will make assessments and kind of prioritize who might need these different environments with referrals from different staff that they work with, as well as kind of chart reviews. And then we provide the support in the sensory rooms, in surgery and in lab, the sensory features in the specialty care center. And then we have these sensory items available to inpatients and kind of throughout the hospital. So coping plans, this is kind of the outline of a coping plan. It is in Epic, it's in the front of the chart. 
I will say everyone's epic is a little different. So talk to your leadership if you can't find it. It should be on the snapshot for, for impatients. You should be able to view it on your track board in the ED if you add a column to indicate that. The multi-provider schedule for outpatient clinics, you should be able to add a column to, to give you that indicator if they have one. And then in surgery, when you open up the chart for the navigator. Again, Epic looks different for everyone, so talk to your leadership if you can't find it. But the coping plan tells you who the kid is. It gives you a reason. So why did they get this coping plan? Is there a developmental disability you should be aware of? High medical anxiety, sensory processing differences. Why do you need extra information about this child? What are their triggers? What kind of things easily upset them? Sometimes it's predictable, loud noises, medical procedures. Sometimes it's unpredictable. I had a kid the other day, his trigger is singing. And that's really natural. You sing the ABCs to calm them would not work for him. So we put that in big trigger. Don't sing. It's not going to calm him. It's not going to help anything. Signs when they're upset. How do they communicate that? Do they verbalize it and tell you? Is it crying? Are there different behaviors? Behavior is communication. When kids do different behaviors, they're telling you something. So that's where we'll also indicate if they have self-injurious or aggressive behaviors, that's a communication of them telling you something, but also important for you to know what those behaviors look like. How do you comfort them? Is distraction helpful, engaging, changing their attention, or do you need to back away? Some kids really need that time and space. Everyone needs to just leave them alone. When they get upset, move away. What kind of things in the environment help? Are they avoiders that need you to turn down the lights, limit people in the room, put a quiet area? Are they sensory seekers who benefit from the projector and the sensory rover and the sensory toys in their room when they come in? What do you do if a procedure isn't going well? Some kids, you gotta move quickly. You gotta just keep going, power through, get it over with. Other kids really benefit from that break. If you stop, give them a couple minutes, try it again a little later. So when we make these coping plans with families, we're assessing what typically works. And sometimes it just says varies. Sometimes it's not the same. So that answer could just be varies by situation, figure it out in the moment type thing. Coping for needle-based procedures, what helps when they need pokes? Is it preparation ahead of time? Is it distraction? Is there a certain kind of pain management like Emla or Buzzy or Painies? What gets the kids through? Or are needle-based procedures really hard and nearly impossible? We have some kids who it says, this is very hard. Please do under sedation whenever possible. What are their interests? What kind of things do they like? What are their favorite things? And then communication. So we break this down into expressive versus receptive because we know that nonverbal does not mean non-understanding. So in the coping plan, it'll tell you, are they nonverbal and they communicate by gesturing, pointing, sign language, communication, uh, like PEX images, different pictures. Do they say a couple words, but it's kind of limited or verbal with full sentences, very communicative verbally. And then how do they receptively? How much do they seem to understand? Everything you say, most of it, only some, kind of spelling that out. What are those sensory sensitivities? to noise, light, touch, taste, and smell. And then we'll also mention if there are self-stimming behaviors to be aware of, if they're known to spin, hand flap, jump, different things like that to soothe themselves. So I apologize, it's a little tiny, but here's an example of what it looks like. It says that this patient has autism and a developmental delay. Their triggers are vegetables. Um, <laughs> their interests are Jonas Brothers and High School Musical. I, I made this one. Um, so it just kind of walks you through how they communicate and what things are hard or easy for these patients. So the one thing I want to emphasize is the parents and guardians are their child's best expert, right? We need to listen to them about all these things. We don't know their child. We're just meeting for the first time. So if we listen to them and know how to take care of them the best way possible that are uh, and remove all the triggers that we possibly can, um, you're going to set up for a better experience. So we're kind of moving on to uh, the adaptive sensory environments. Um, we didn't innovate this. I stole this. Uh, it's been around since 1970s by Dutch therapists. Uh, Use multisensory um, <clears throat> tents with those with learning disabilities. And it's an immersive space where you can enjoy sensory experience in a safe, engaging area. Um, so what is it? Again, it's a room specifically designed for that patient. Uh, we call them adaptive because we take their coping plan and we adapt to what they like and don't like. We move things in and out based on that um, to make sure that we give them enough to either fill up their cup or make sure their cup's not too full of light, sound, 
in surgery, we don't have taste, thank God. Um, but those are kind of the things we do to help them de-escalate, remove the anxiety, remove anything that'll make them hyperactive. Uh, what I tell my staff upstairs is they shouldn't be coming into our environment. We should be going into their environment. We need to make them as comfortable as possible when we see them to disarm them. And that way we're not giving medications just to sedate them to make the process go better. So these rooms, these sensory environments are evidence-based practice and the research supports that these environments reduce anxiety and unwanted behaviors, increases patient experiences and serves as a therapeutic tool. And we quoted a couple of research studies there of sensory environments in different settings, giving kids back that control to change the colors, turn the lights up and down, change what that environment is, gives increased, atten increased attention and reduces behaviors. Um, in a study on sensory processing for adults with developmental disabilities, virtual sensory rooms were correlated with a significant reduction in their anxiety. The forensic mental health setting has used sensory rooms and decreased stress and improved patient experiences. And then in a psychiatric ICU, both patients and staff saw their sensory environments as a therapeutic tool. These are also research based in healthcare too. So modifying environments and providing sensory materials served as a non-pharmacological intervention in the perioperative setting in one study by Winterberg et al. Multi-sensory devices have been used for distraction and to decrease anxiety. In that study, they used what's called a Vecta, but it's like our rovers here, that multi-sensory, you have the lights, the sounds, the different features. And then the dental setting. The dental setting has done a lot of studies about sensory environments and how these environments support positive coping in their patients with developmental disabilities, but also their typically developing patients. Everyone benefits from the sensory environment. It reduces pain, discomfort, behavioral distress, and psychological distress. And it was a, they found an important factor in successfully successful outcomes in these dental studies. Some of the interventions these studies use were weighted blankets, dimmed lights, and headphones. So we're just going to go through some examples of what we've done. Um, and this all started in the perioperative space in surgery with a rover in the corner, a conversation between myself, some of our nurses, and our child life specialist at the time, about seven years ago now, of how we could do something better. Um, and from there, it turned into a quality improvement project. But basically, we keep finding more and more things that we think may help. Um, some have worked, some have not worked. Uh, but you can kind of see in the pictures, some of the things we have are um, LED marble walls that is, gives you that tactile feeling, but also the visual of the lights. Um, we find that actually parents enjoy that a lot more than the kids do sometimes. Um, but, you know, in surgery, there's a lot of things, you know, that are different. We're changing their routines, right? They're used to waking up a certain time, having the same breakfast. Suddenly we're telling them not to eat, come into the hospital, change out of the clothes that are comfortable for you into a gown that you've never felt before. The texture might be wrong. We don't have the best linens. We all know that, right? We have people you've never met before coming in out of the room, talking to you. Um, and it's just a scary environment. When we first started a our pre-op room, which I don't have an actual picture of here, is just a generic white wall room with the bed in the middle. And there was a fluorescent light right above the bed. And one of the parents asked if we could turn the light off or dim it. We weren't able to dim the lights at the time. Um, and I asked why. So we don't perceive this, but fluorescent lights flicker at 50 hertz. So to her child with autism was sitting under there, it was a torture chamber. He was staring up at this bright light that we were in, it weren't able to dim and it was just flickering. So think about that. So this is, these are the things we started thinking about in surgery and started slowly adapting the rooms. They're dimmable now. They're all LED, so they don't actually get that perception anymore. Um, we're able to bring things in or out. So if they don't like medical supplies, we take them all out. We don't even put the gurney in the room. We have crash pads where they can lay on the ground. We have comfy chairs that they can sit in. So it doesn't feel like a hospital to them. Um, we're able to turn down the lights. We have the rover if we need to. We have headphones. We have sunglasses. And what we've learned um, is, again, this is not one person doing this. It's not child life. It's not myself. It's nursing. It's a collaborative project that throughout the course of them waiting in pre-op, which can be an hour if we're behind, 90 minutes to two hours, things change. 
And our staff is so adaptable now that they will actually bring more things in or take things out depending on how that's going. Um, and Elise will go a little bit more into it. But as you can see, you know, we can move the bed to where it is. So sometimes we make it look like a couch. Um, we hide it with pillows and blankets so that way they don't realize it's a bed. Um, but anything you can do to just change the environment for the better um, based on their coping plan. These are just a few more pictures of kind of what those surgery rooms look like. Um, different chairs that can kind of provide that pressure. Floor tiles. No patient really has to sit on the bed for most of what we do. So we let them sit wherever. Um, like Sean said, we turn it like a couch. I had a patient the other day, very high medical anxiety. We barely got him in the building. Through the course of his visit, he sat on the bed because it was a couch with his caregiver. So we never called it a bed. We said, can you sit on the couch, sit on the couch? Third time, picks up his carpet square and sits on the couch to start picking at it. And he was able to receive his injection on the bed, but we called it a couch because it was sideways and didn't look as intimidating. We also now have a sensory room in lab. And this room is, these lab draws are either scheduled with child life to provide that all encompassing care. So not only the environment, but the psychosocial support through education and distraction. Um, and then they're also kind of walk-in. Some of the important features with this room, we have a variety of seats. So you can sit in the extra wide chair and fit both caregiver and patient. You can sit or lay on the bed if that's what you need. There is a floor mat. So if you need to be on the floor for the lab draw, we can do that. We have a rover in there, floor tiles, a variety of sensory toys. The lights can be changed. This one light up here is so that we can do a lab draw with the lights dimmed. So we can turn all the lights down and just shine light where the phlebotomist is poking and not the entire room during the procedure. Um, and then there's that floor mat too. And then we don't have sensory rooms in outpatient clinics, but we can create sensory environments. So all these rooms were plain, regular outpatient rooms before we put the items in. We put projectors, floor tiles, there's marble walls and light up wall panels that are in a variety of different rooms in the SCC. And then we have these sensory rover carts. They're a little smaller in the outpatient setting that we can take to anyone who needs it. So through that assessment, figuring out where these kids are going ahead of time, we can plan to have those resources but they're also available throughout the whole building. So if staff encounter a patient, they didn't know ahead of time, finding out they have sensory needs, these tools are available to all areas. And I wanted to kind of point out with this example in ophthalmology, adapting care. This patient didn't want to sit on the chair for her exam. That was her big thing. Didn't want to sit in the chair for her eye exam. So we never sat on the chair. We walked through what needed to happen, what was actually important. We needed to look at her eyes. We needed her to stand far enough from the screen, so we put down the gel floor tiles. She never needed to sit in the chair, we just needed her the appropriate distance. And then Dr. Young, her provider, came to her on the parent chair, because that's where this patient was more comfortable. So our sensory environments, our sensory features are great. We also understand they're not everywhere. As much as we wish we had them everywhere, they're not everywhere. So there's simple things that you can do no matter where you are to adapt care in any setting. One is meeting that sensory need. What is that need? Is it to remove items so that they can move around? Sometimes something as simple as pulling out the parent chair so the kid can spin and run can be really helpful. Do you dim the lights or put the patient's room at the end of the hallway where it's quieter, put them down on the other side away from the crying babies? And then providing items to meet the sensory need. The kid that's pulling at cords, they're pulling, unplugging the computers because they're all eye level. Instead of continuing saying, no, 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 we can give them something to pull. This is safe. They can pull this. They can get that input of a pulling sensation without turning off the computer while the doctor is charting. The kid who's pressing buttons, we give them safe buttons. It's a problem if they're typing on the computer while the nurse is doing their check-in. So we give them buttons that they can press on to make it okay. For our orally seeking patients, meeting that need, whether that's through a chewy, or we've had a couple patients for eye exams who every time we put the lens in front of their face, their mouth moves. So we started holding one lens on their mouth while we hold another on their eye. So I kind of wiggle to give that oral input. Doctor gets the whole exam from the eye. So it's recognizing what is that need. It's frustrating when the kid keeps moving their face while you're trying to look in their eyes. So we give them that input in their oral area with their mouth, and then they can sit still and tolerate that exam. And then also encouraging families to bring the comfort items. Majority of our patients' families do have these resources at home if it's really important to the kid, whether it's headphones, tablets, blankets, stuff like that. So encouraging families, if that helps, bring it. Bring all of it with you if needed to help support your patient. 
preparation. What to expect? What is going to be expected of the child? What do we need from them? So that they know when they're not surprised when suddenly a flashlight is shined at their ears or their eyes. We have videos. So for um, MRIs, surgery, and sleep studies, we have videos on our website so patients can watch and see what is going to happen when they come to their hospital for that visit. Or visual schedules. This is a really helpful tool that breaks down the steps of the entire visit. In ophthalmology, we have two-hour visits typically with a lot of demands for the patient. So we put them down in a schedule and we pull them off as we finish each demand. So it's a very visual representation of how much longer do we have to get through this visit. I have another patient for all of her visits up in neurology, they're just talking appointments, but she has so much anxiety. We do a visual schedule so she can constantly remember what's happening. In the whole visit, she'll say no needles. We say no needles and we walk through what is happening. We're gonna sit, we're gonna talk to the doctor, the doctor's gonna listen to her and we're gonna leave. And we go over it over and over visually because of her high anxiety with needles. Other simple adaptions are talking to family outside the room, especially if the kid is sensitive, do all the providers need to talk in the room or can we step out so it's a quieter environment for the patient? Limiting staff who really needs to be in the room versus would be nice to be in the room. Condensing care. This is a huge thing. Do all six people need to listen with the stethoscope? In surgery, a common adaptation is we wait for anesthesia because in the end they have to listen. They're sedating the kid. So we have the nurse and the NP skip. So we're not constantly agitating the child. In ophthalmology, same thing. The ophthalmologist needs to look with the flashlight. That's essential. The text when they're checking them in, we don't need to irritate them when we know the doctor also has to look. So being flexible about does everybody need to do that or only one person if the child's struggling to tolerate it. Pressures and squeezes, that deep sensory input. If you're holding their hand so that they don't reach for something, you can provide that rhythmic squeezes to provide that input while also making sure they don't reach for the na nasal cannula or whatever you don't want them to reach for. Squeezes on the shoulders are helpful. I had a patient where the whole exam, we kind of put methodical rhythmic pressure on their shoulders and they remain still for the whole entire exam with that input. And then we wanted to give kind of this visual because this is from an article and they break it down, they call it space, but it's kind of rec recognizing different adaptations for all that sensory input. And it's a really great chart. We have it in our references, the study, um, but some different things, smell, simple things you can do is limit perfume, limit those additional odors whenever possible. For our patients with introception and um, concerns, maybe they don't register pain the same way. So recognizing that pain scales might need to be adapted. You might need to follow nonverbal cues if they can't connect between their brain and the body, what is pain? and what's going on. Or touch, thinking about sensory friendly clothing choices. Do they have to be in the gown? Can they maybe just be without a shirt? We had one patient who, we, quite a few patients, who won't tolerate the gown. So we just say no shirt and pants, and that way we can give them their injection or do their procedure, whatever it might be, but we don't bother putting the gown if that's gonna agitate them. And since we're a little ahead of schedule, I am going to play one thing if I can get to the chat real quick. Now that we've talked about this, um, I play this every year for our perioperative nursing staff. And I just want you to listen to it and think about it and think about the scenario. If you were the physician or the provider in the emergency room when this child came in, what would you do? It's time now for StoryCorps. Late last year, 33-year-old Walker Hughes tried a new medication. Instead of helping him calm down, though, the medication made him agitated. Walker had autism and struggled to communicate what was going on, but his mom, Ellen, knew they had to get to a hospital. We're driving at rush hour, and my sweet guy is screaming and grabbing me, and we're just scared to death. This is not the guy I know at all. As they arrived at Loyola Medicine near Chicago, Walker bit Ellen. That's when they encountered public safety sergeant Keith Miller. Ellen and Keith came to StoryCorps to talk about that day. We were already anticipating what was going to happen in this emergency room. Because when he was a little boy, an officer got on his back while he was screaming. And he's been handcuffed to gurneys in emergency oh, wow. rooms just for having a seizure and being big. That day, we show up at a hospital. Here's this giant six foot three guy just bit his old mom. Yeah. I'm sitting there brokenhearted, yeah. scared out of my mind, bleeding, yeah. and Walker's trying to run away. 
and I see like five guys on him. And all I can think is this will not end well. They're going to kill him. But suddenly I hear this cute game. All right. <laughs> where he's trying to escape and you're going, Walker gets up. Walker sits down. Walker scoots back. Walker lies down. And then he said high fives all around. And I thought he won't do it. And I look and he's beaming and he's high fiving every mm-hmm. single officer. And then you started singing. And I thought I would lose it forever. I started singing Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. You're singing Mr. Rogers with these (laughs) men. And he went from being terrified Mm -hmm. to feeling like he had cool friends, cool guys hanging out with him. I saw this man who was dealing with something he just did not understand. Yes. And I saw the fear in your face. It, It touched me personally. Um, my son is 14. Uh, he was 15 months when he was first diagnosed as being autistic. Being a father of a child who has autism, I don't know what changes is going to occur in him. And as parents, we're there to help them deal with their obstacles. And if we can't do it by ourselves, there's other people out there to help. And I want to be one of those other people. Well, nobody else does what you do. We look like a very scary situation coming in there. And we turned into a kind of party I think people wanted to join. I've been in a lot of ERs, and some people have been kind of nice. I never sat there and felt like this is one of the most important moments of my life. Ellen Hughes. So I just want you to think about that. In less than 15 seconds, they were able to make a connection and change the outcome for that patient. Had it gone another way, I'm sure he would have been strapped down, sedated, and things would have been different, okay? Um, So we all have a part in this, and I think we can all do what we need to for our patients. And so I just want to leave you with, if you met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. If you met one person with sensory processing differences, you've met one person with sensory processing differences. The graphic on the right side shows it's not less or more autistic. In each part of their life, each single sense, there's varying degrees, and we need to remember that. Um, And then if you want to know more about our sensory programs and what we've done, um, this is just a little QR code to send you to all those links um, because people do ask about it afterwards. Um, So I guess we're going to open up to questions, and uh, thank you guys for listening. And if Those in the auditorium, if you haven't grabbed a a fidget on your way out, please grab a fidget um, because everyone enjoys those. Okay, opening up to questions. Any questions in the audience? Any questions online? Going once, going twice. And sold for getting out 15 minutes early. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.